Uh, welcome to Awkward Devs 1 to 5. A um, couple of things on the agenda today uh, merge updates, uh, updates on Arrow Glacier, uh, and then Ansgar has an EIP which would modify the EIP 1559 mechanism to better account for missed slots after the merge. And then finally, uh, Dankrad and Guillaume are here to chat about vertical tries and the general stateless roadmap. Um, and we could kind of get through the first three things and then give Dankrad and Guillaume uh, the rest of the call to go over uh, their stuff. Um, yeah, so first, any client team want to share updates about the merge, where things are at, any issues they've encountered? Uh, I can start. Um, awesome. So um, we're currently looking into merging all the code from uh, Amphora, uh, from, from the interop. Um, until now, nothing major came up. I've also started setting up a server for merge fuzz and um, am fuzzing uh, guests right now. Um, but I'll add some other other uh, execution layer clients to it. For those who don't know, merge fuzz is a differential fuzzer that basically just uh, calls the engine API of two different clients and sees if uh, they do exactly the same thing. Um, yeah, so that's that's uh, uh, our update. Oh, did you find anything with the fuzzer so far? Uh, I f we found something in the synchronization call uh, 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 in the sync code that was not final yet, um, okay. but. Uh, Nothing really major. Awesome. Uh, Merrick, I think you were about to start speaking. Uh, yeah, uh, we continue cleaning up our uh, merge code. Uh, we set up all consensus client in our infrastructure with Nethermind as execution engine, of course. Uh, we are in contact with Nimbus team because something not working with uh, Nimbus and Nethermind. Uh, yeah, it looks like we are working after uh, the Marius test, and that is all, I think, from Got another it. mindset. Thanks for sharing. Um, I see, Andrew, you're here. Any updates from Aragon? Um, no, not yet. No. Okay. Um, I thought it was someone in the discords. Uh, I don't think they had the real name, but they were starting to implement the merge and asking a bunch of questions. Um, yeah. Um, oh, Danny, you were gonna say something? I can, yeah, I can give an update on, um, we are primarily Mikhail, myself and some others are quickly closing in on uh, the final updates to consensus layer specs, execution layer specs and the engine API that came out of Amphora. Um, I might do a pre-release later today and point to a commit on each that kind of gives you pretty much what's happening, uh, but we likely will finish more on Monday. There's a little bit more work to, to patch up between now and then, but but very close. And then um, that would be breaking with respect to Pythos and we would start kind of a new wave of, of uh, testnet targets in November. Got it. And just for context, if you don't have the context, mo it's largely similarly structured. Uh, there's probably a few edge cases that are patched up and generally simplifications uh, and reductions in the, the engine API. Uh, so it's not uh, not throwing uh, a ton of shit out or anything like that. Got it. Um, is anyone from Baseu on the call? Oh, Justin. Just yeah. Basic. Awesome. Nice. Um, yeah, we don't really have any updates right now. Um, we're we're cruising along. We're merging in all of the code from uh, the interop exercise. Um, that's that's still in progress. So, uh, got it. Nothing uh, nothing new or major to report. Okay. That's all, Gary. By the way, so I don't have any hard details <laughs> on it. No worries. 
Um, cool. So any anything else anyone wanted to discuss about the merge? Okay. Um, next up is just Arrow Glacier. Um, so on the last call, we kind of decided for a block number and a, and a, a delay for the difficulty bomb. Um, I guess I'm curious to see how how far along are clients in implementing this and like how realistic is it to have a release in the next week uh, from client teams with this, just so we could announce it about a month in advance. Um, yeah, I guess anyone from any client team want to go first? So we haven't done it yet, but uh, of course we can release it in the next week. It, it should be very, very easy. So, yeah. Cool. Okay, so next week is possible. Um, Marius, you're first on my screen, so Geth. Yeah, uh, Martin, Implemented it, we've merged it into the code, and our next release should contain it. I'm not sure if we're going okay. to do a release next week, but I think so. So, yeah. Cool. Uh, Aragon? Uh, yeah, we haven't done it yet, but we should be able to do it next week and uh, should be, yeah, probably we'll release it next week. Okay, cool. And uh, Basu? Uh, same story here. We haven't implemented yeah. it, but we have a quarterly quarterly release scheduled uh, in the next week. Uh, we'll likely have it included there. Awesome. Um, um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to, uh, as far as I know, um, there are new difficulty tests uh, in the test repo. So when you implement it, you can check out the new tests as well. Anything else on Aero Glacier? Um, and cool. So I guess for people listening uh, and, and who are looking to like plan their upgrade, uh, the fork block is going to happen uh, at or the fork is going to happen at block thirteen million seven seven three zero zero zero. Um, that's expected to hit around December eighth. Um, so a bit more than a month from now. Um, and one thing that would also be useful, uh, I, I guess only Get has it implemented now, but if somebody can just share the fork hash, like the 2124 uh, hash, so we can add it to the spec, that would be great. Sorry, what hash? Uh, the, the kind of fork identifier. The from... Fork ID, yes. Yeah. Uh, it's in my PR. Uh, I can paste it uh, on the PM. Awesome. Thanks. Um, Anything else on Aero Glacier? Okay, uh, if not, uh, then Ensgar has been working on an EIP which uh, would uh, basically modify EIP 1559's mechanism around the merge uh, so that we can better account for missed slots in how we update the base fee. Uh, I think he literally finished a draft yesterday um, do you want to take a couple minutes and start to kind of walk us through how this changes things and why this might be important to, to do for the merge? Sure. Should I uh, share my screen for that or just talk about sure. it? Yeah, if you have anything to share, go for it. I mean, I can yeah, just maybe visit there like a two or three graphs and then I might be nice to see. Uh, can, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, awesome. Yeah, so so, so basically the, uh, the situation is just that um, with 1559 right now, the, the, the base fee, of course, looks at the um, gas used in the parent block to determine whether the base fee should go up or go down. Uh, and with, um, with the merge, uh, we'll have these usually regular slots every 12 seconds. But then if there's a missed slot, of course, that's, that basically means that there's like a 24 second window. And just because transactions continue to uh, accumulate, right? Like you'd basically always expect a 24, um, uh, um, seconds uh, a block basically to have on average twice as many transactions. So missed slots would usually re um, result in, in little base fee spikes. And um, so the question was just, A, is this a big problem? Or is it just a small annoyance? And then B, 
uh, is there something small we could do to, 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 to mitigate that? And so basically, this is just one proposal. So the question is just basically the, the actions we could take, you would be do this, do nothing at all, do something else, um, or just uh, wait, 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 wait for Shanghai, basically. Um, Yes, so so, so the, the the approach here is relatively simple. It's just be, because like the, the the kind of the, the core problem here is that we don't really account for block times. Uh, it it adds like a um, a simple uh, block time uh, based rule to the to the calculation. Uh, important to note that under proof of stake, there's no way for for block proposals to manipulate the block time because it's um, like it's always enforced on the beacon chain side that the like every slug only has one valid um, timestamp that it could use. So there's no there's no wiggle room or anything. So it's really like a very simple way. Similar, it's basically um, and this the, it has the same properties as, as the slot number, but it's easy accessible from the execution side. Um, and so for, yeah, first why 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 could it be kind of like important to do that with the merge? So it's um, for one, of course, it's a little, little bit annoying um, with with these with these base fee spikes. I think that's the, the least of the, of the of the problems. Um the second thing that is a little bit more more important, I think, is that uh, basically every lost slot is like a permanent lost throughput for the chain. So if we if basically the, a slot is missed, that means that we just have fifty million or whatever uh, guys we have in the block, and um, just less of of overall throughput. And one, I think, I would argue that this is just not desirable because um, I mean, we set these throughput targets to reach them or to, have to stay below them. But also, more importantly, this kind of like gives a more clear incentive for denial of service attack against block proposals. Um, so just because we don't have yet like these um, secret uh, block proposal elections, um, there are some concerns that potentially block proposals could be de-anonymized and, and targeted in the denial of service attacks. And in the, under the current situations, every Block proposal that you can basically stop from from producing the block means the throughput of the chain goes down by by, the, by that block amount, um, which kind of increases the incentive. And if, and if we could mitigate that, of course, that would that would kind of like make you know our service attacks less uh, useful for attackers, which would be really nice. And then the last concern um, is uh, what are we describing here? And they like uh, degradation during consensus issues. So um, I mean, of course, hopefully this will never become relevant. But if we ever have uh, situations where like a large a number of, of validators goes offline at the same time uh, and a proof of work right now, this is usually quickly self-healing where basically you just um, they have the difficulty adjustment. And so while the uh, block times go up uh, for a little while, they, they, they come back down um, quite soon. And so the throughput is only per, like, um, impacted for a very short time, and if we stake, uh, we still have a self healing mechanism, but it could take much longer, right? Like it, especially if it's less than a third, so if the change still finalizes, uh, it could take literal months. Uh, even if we are like below the finalization threshold and we have difficult um, and inactivity leaks, it could still like be weak. So basically, like, uh, and of course we could then start to manually inter intervene and just increase the, the, the gas limit. But again, also this manual attack in, in intervention would, would take quite some time. So so with much more permanent impacts to the uh, throughput of the chain. And that is basically during times where the stress on the chain is already at, at the highest because like we, we have these consensus. Right? So, so not only do we have like a period where <laughs> There will be more more activity because people will want to react to the consensus issue, but it's also reduced through throughput, which is just like not ideal for the stability of the chain. Um, and so, for obvious reasons, I think it would be important to do this at the point of the merge already, so we don't have a period of proof of stake without without this adjustment. Um, the specification that I proposed was like really motivated to be as minimal as possible. So this is kind of taking the EIP fifteen fifty nine. Uh, update rule and just basically it's, it's really if you, if you look at it it's just basically it, it, it changes like five lines of code or something it, it adds like these two uh, constants just block fan target and a, um, basically a maximum of, of, of what we want to allow um, so basically this this just means that we basically allow up to 95 percent of the block to be used as, as basically like a um, as a target so say right now with the elasticity of two basically this would mean that like um, we basically be um, allow the, the the gas target to go up to 1.9 times uh, the block, um, um, and then the only changes in here is, is that we have this extra um, sorry this extra line that that does this adjusted um, gas target calculation. 
and then uses it down here. But it's yeah. So this is basically like four or five lines of change. So it's, it's really minimal. So shouldn't shouldn't impact them too much or too much. It what it does do is though it it means that now the base calculation does depend on the grandparent of a block as well, not only on the parent because we need to access its timestamp. So that is one more block you need you need to have available uh, to validate the header. That is a significant change. Um. Right, and that's basically uh, that's basically that. The one important thing is to maybe briefly talk about limitations. Um, so, because basically in the count in, the, in this minimal change, all you can do is really kind of account for more or less for one missed slot. But if as soon as you have two or three missed slot in in a row, basically you you, you just can't because we only have a local assistance. You have two. There's just no way of kind of like recovering all these transactions. Um, and so, as you can as you can see, I put like a little graph in here. So basically, like with the depending on the on the percentage of offline book proposals, the throughput of course does go down. Um, the blue line would be what we have today, and then of course, um, like what I proposed would be like for the brown uh, line here. Um, so basically, like as you can see, we have a much more gradual de decline initially, which is exactly what we need for for dust protection, right? So basically, there's almost no decline initially, and then even even in situations where like 20, 30, 40 percent. Uh, of, of block proposals offline, we still have like much less degradation than, than we would usually have. Um, but of course it's, it's, it's not perfect. And so like the last thing is where maybe I would want some input is there are some extensions. So you could, you could make this much better, basically much, much less degradation until, until you go down way, way further. But those would require slightly more involved changes. So this would, would add one header element. Um, or alternatively, could also do this by accessing not only the parent and the grandparent of a block, but like the last 10, 15, 20, 30 and ancestors. But that also seems like a more, more kind of like substantive change. Um, and this here would be um, if, if we were, were to increase the elasticity of a block from 2 to 2.5 or 3 or something, that would also help quite a bit. I would argue this might actually be feasible just because under proof of stake, we have these 12 second block times as a minimum. And so it's already much reduced stress. Right now we could have block times of three seconds if we basically, if the randomness of proof of work turns out uh, against us. And so the strain is already much reduced under proof of work. So I think there might be a case to do this as well. But again, the objective was to keep the change as minimal as possible. So these are optional um, additions. Um, right, I think that's basically all. And so then the, 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 just basically for context, it's, it's really just because as Danny was saying, we kind of, uh, the, the, the kind of the specs for the execution side, for both execution side and the side, kind of are supposed to be more or less final um, very soon. So if we really want to consider this uh, for the merge, we sh that would be the call we'd have to make very soon. Um, yeah, and so feedback would be appreciated. That's all. I have a question. Okay. Uh, yeah. I had a bit of a hard time understanding what you meant by denial of service. Um, uh, yeah, how, how it improves the situation against denial of service. Um, as I understand it, and please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, like what if there is um, some transactions that for whatever reason causes uh, a large majority of the nodes to process the blocks very slowly? So the block time increases. Uh, I think it, I mean, it, it can be seen as if like 50% of the seeders go offline. Um, now, uh, if I understood you correctly, the, the, what would happen is that the base fee would go down and the actual transactions included in the blocks would go up. Uh, to, yeah, basically it have the miners go down and the block times double, then you would have double the amount of transactions in the block. So it feels like that would make the denial of service attack worse. Now, did I misunderstand something? Um, so, well, I mean, I think that's a different right, it's a kind different of denial of service. service. Exactly. Yes. That's it. So basically, there are two denial of service um, problems. One is, as you were saying, like transactions that take a long time to execute. But the other one is to target specific block proposers. So you can, like, there are some worries that you can just basically based on um, uh, message relay 
patterns. You can you can de-anonymize uh, the uh, like the IP addresses behind specific um, validators, and then because it's known in advance uh, when it's their turn to produce a block, you could like specifically target them um, just before that time and make them go offline for a short amount of time so that they are not able to to produce a block. Um, right. So the context which you are discussing is the like East 2 world, the post-merge. Um, right. So in the context of the pre-merge world, um, what I said, do, does it make sense or did I still misunderstand something? Right, so... Um... Well, a small, small thing, just it, it would not actually decrease the base fee, it would just stop the base fee from increasing. Um, when the blocks be like, if say, like basically only only every other um, block proposer um, actually, uh, well, okay, if, if you're talking about proof of work, of course, right? If basically the block times yes. start going up, um, then that, that would basically mean that um, the the blocks were allowed to be more than half full on average. Um, that does mean indeed that if we have a proof of work attack similar to like the Shanghai attacks where we um, just have like very slow to process blocks, um, that that would basically mean that the, well, it, it wouldn't actually ch change much. It would just basically mean that like the new equilibrium would be a little bit different so instead of basically having say, I don't know, if you did, if, if, if as you were saying, your example, usually like say the block times would double. Now they would basically go up 4x, but every block would be twice as full on average. It would still like reach a new equilibrium where basically um, blocks yeah, are slow would enough. Would it reach to... a new equilibrium though? I mean, if, if, if the throughput as in, you know, gas per second, well, gas per block should be constant and the nodes cannot, I mean, wouldn't it be like form some kind of cycle where uh, the block gets uh, slower and so we have more transactions go into it and that makes it even slower and more transactions go in and it like some kind of self-reinforcing cycle um, right. um, effects. The nice thing is that we just, that that can't ever happen because we have this strict upper bound of the elasticity, right? So right now we have like a 2x maximum size and we can just can't go beyond that. So even if we end up with 2x the box size, that's that's the limit. Um, so so basically there, there's no no kind of room for, for any of for the cycle. If you were to completely remove the elasticity, you're, you're right. That this, this All right, so it, so it would happen. do that to a point and then there would be a steep, there's a much more steep drop than at some point. Right, but but again, I would I like um, basically I would say that that's what we have the gas limit adjustment mechanism for, right? Like I mean, similar to what what happened during the Shanghai attacks. That in in that scenario, you would just basically advise miners to uh, reduce the, um, the the gas limit. Right. But, but yeah, yes, I wasn't really mm -hmm. sure how your proposal um, interacted with the gas limit, um, if it did. Um, no, no, no. It, it does. It does not in any way change the gas limit, and, and I think that is important because, indeed, like the gas limit is, is is relevant for security considerations. So it just acts within the gas limit. It just basically sets the gas target instead of always targeting half full blocks. It allows more than half full blocks to be targeted. Um, if blocks basically come in slower than expected, so so that it balances out, but it, it never changes the gas limit. Um, yeah. Right. And yeah. Okay. Then that I think alleviates my concern. I think uh, that was the part I missed. Then. Yeah. Uh, I think. Michael, okay. yeah, I have a simple question. Why can't we iterate uh, over these uh, slots, treat them as an empty block and just re uh, use already existing formula and with each iteration apply this formula to compute the base fee of the block that finally exists? 
So do you mean basically, um, uh, yeah, okay. So, so, so if we just basically insert artificial empty blocks um, in, in, into missed slots, the problem is that that kind of um, set basically just sends an incorrect signal. So because an empty block would signal that there's um, no demand. Um, so so that, that, would, that would basically lower the, um, the, the base fee. Um, and, but but it, it would end up resulting more or less in the same situation because you'd lower the base fee before the, the, the next block. And then in the next block, you, because it would on average be twice as full, you increase it back up. But that just basically means that we have the incorrect base fee. It, it would end up in almost the same situation as in my proposal, just that these, the slot after in, in this slot would just basically have artificially too low base fee and so too much um, extraction by the mine, uh, like um, P extraction by the miner. Um, but it would I mean, know, honestly, like, um, it just feels more complex doing it that way because you still need some scheme like what happens if several blocks are missing and so on and just breaking this one to one block correspondence seems wrong right yeah i also would say that uh, uh, that the, these artificial blocks would be more complex um but I mean, otherwise, I mean, the, the comment was, I think, yeah, um, it, it makes sense, right? Because like the, the, the effect would more or less be the same. Um, it just, yeah, but again. My concern is just that we change the logic and it's, it's, it's from some standpoint is more complex than use already existing logic. It's just applied like in, in a specific way. We don't need but to- But inserting empty certain... blocks is also changing the logic, right? No, we don't need to insert those blocks at all. So we just need to apply this uh, formula like 10 times if we, if we have 10 slots missed before this block. Right, but the, like, the, the problem there is that basically that means that the base fee goes down in situations where it should not go down. That that is the main problem, and especially if you do it iteratively, if you don't only don't don't only and, do and it Sky, I don't think that's true. I think it's equivalent, right? More or less. Like I think yeah, it's I equivalent. Think so I don't think that's right. Down. Yeah. So I don't think that is the right. argument. It's purely about complexity. Which one we consider more complex? And I feel like this is the better solution. I mean, both are similar complexity. Pretty much, if you do the diff and timestamp mod slot time, and then run a formula that number of times versus doing a slightly different formula. I think it's pretty similar to complexity. I'm not arguing oh, for one way right. or the other. But the execution client doesn't have the slot numbers, right? No, you have, like, that's a timestamp. That's why I said mod slot time. So, so like right. block time at target is a proxy in here for slot time. Right, right. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, if, this, maybe just... if these two formulas are kind of equivalent then yeah cool um i thought that this like a bit uh, the mechanism that you have proposed is just a bit different from what i've been thinking about it why is parent why, why is parent block time why why are we doing that like using a grandparent instead of just the diff between current block and parent um, just because like the way we, like the, the base fee calculation just happens when we validate the, uh, the, the base fee in the block, but that basically means we have to look at the, uh, the situation in the parent. And then, so, so um, within that, we need the, the block time of the parent. The block time of the parent is just the difference between its, the grandparent and the parent. Um, right? because, because the base fee is never adjusted for the block itself, it's always adjusted for the next block. Well, 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 what would break if we just make it based on the time delta between the block and the parent instead? Because, like, I guess the way that I philosophically think about this is that I think of the base fee update as being two separate updates. There's a uh, always uh, positive update as a result of gas being consumed and a an always negative uh, update as a result of time passage. So, like, in theory, it shouldn't matter if the order of the two gets flipped. Right, that's a good point. I'd have to think about it. Um, yeah. Who happened if, uh, yeah, there is also the like missed slots uh, before the parent block, like missed slots between the grandparent and the parent. Uh, like, no matter how you do it, like every single span of two blocks gets, uh, or every single span between two blocks gets counted once, right? So it should be fine anyway. Mm.
yeah, yeah, that generally sounds plausible. Um, just again, I think that, yeah, just have to have to look, just think about it briefly, just to make sure that there's no even no small within a block inconsistencies where like the base view in a block is not the, the one it should be, and then even if it like basically this um, that returns to the correct one in the next block. Ideally, you you never want to um, individual blocks where the minor um, basically um, has a too too low or too high base view. Does the execution client know the slot time currently? No, it could. I mean, it knows the timestamp, and the timestamp is ensured to be congruous with slot time by the consensus layer. But uh, it does not know the kind of like beacon genesis time and the slots per second, which if it did, if that was just baked deeply into the configuration of the execution client, it could calculate the slot time based on timestamp. I would, I would be a little hesitant to bake that in the configuration of the execution client because one can imagine a point in the future where we want to change that and having change in both yeah, places would kind of suck. It doesn't seem super valuable to be in there. Although if you look at this PR or this EIP, block time target is essentially a proxy for slots per second. And so if it makes it into so, this EIP, then it is making its way into the configuration there. Yeah, that, that feels... <laughs> <laughs> You basically do need this if you want to do anything about missed slots on the execution side. Yeah, yeah. No way of telling if you have a missed slot. Yeah, I, I agree that it's necessary. It just changes this from, oh, this is a nice, clean, simple solution to now we're bleeding consensus layer logic into the execution client. And that, that's what makes me feel less positive about it. That's all. Yeah, fair. I see that. Yeah, so, so basically, I, I guess I, it doesn't have to be that way. Can't we just simply say the gas target is per second rather than per per block, and then this content concept would disappear? Right. Yeah, yeah like I if we're going that way, then it's simpler. Right. Yeah, that means it wouldn't need an update if the slot time changed in the future. I mean, we could argue but, it right we, now. We, it doesn't need that update anyway. It's just that right still... now it's written as a quotient of oh, things. Right. Yeah, <laughs> I guess like one one nice uh, benefit of making it entirely timestamp based is that if we do change the slot time in the future, we don't need to do anything else to uh, ensure that capacity stays the same across the change. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah, I do like, like that. Just... But if we do it per second, it's just basically we, we st it's still baked in. It's just hidden a little bit more because then it's in the elasticity multiplier because right now it would be two and then it would be 24. And the 24 would just come from. <laughs> um, but the, the point is fundamentally, is fundamentally could the constant should be per second, right? I mean, it's a, like right. if we for some reason decided that like um, poor POS has to be two times slower for some reason, then we would increase it by a factor of two. So I would argue that the fundamental dimension of the constant is gas per second. But the, it's the elasticity that you want on a per second basis. Or on... Right, I, don't see, what it has, I don't see what it has to do with the elasticity. Because the, the missed yeah. blocks are in the past and then the you still have future blocks coming, right? Like so imagine you missed three blocks and you had like you know a three times bigger block then because your elasticity gives it to you. You still need to be able to process that three times bigger block before the next block, which you assume won't be missed, right. arrives. So it's like you can't so, accumulate all the past misses that you you've had. So it, it's, I think that if we ignore what we have implemented today and we just think like conceptually, what, what do we want? What we want is we want the chain to have a certain number of amount of gas per second. How many blocks per second are unrelated to that? Like fundamentally we want gas per second. And the execution client does know, you know, when was the last block and how much gas did that last block use and how much um, time has passed since that last block. And so I think we should Again, purely theoretically, ignoring current implementation, we should have enough information to do gas per second without knowing the future slot time, without knowing what the intention intended slot time is. We should have enough data to answer that question. Now, I don't know how we convert our current system to that. 
in that scenario, it would just replace the elasticity multiplier because we don't, right now, we don't actually explicitly set the gas target. We set only the gas limit and set the elasticity multiplier to calculate the gas target. And if we would set the gas target on a per second basis and we would set the block gas limit, um, which we still need in order to, to do know what the maximum block size is, then we would just no longer need the elasticity, which would just be Im Im implied then. Yeah, so I guess I guess my argument here is weekly that I would rather see us come up with a larger change that makes it so we don't need to um, have the execution client know what the block intended block time is um, when for the merge. Like with the merge, I would rather not have to leak information about block time into the execution client if we can avoid it. And if that means making a larger change, I think I would prefer that personally, um, like a larger change to this formula. I would prefer that over a simpler change that does re result in a leak of information but, from the consensus. So why, why, why is that a problem? I don't get that. Like fundamentally- Why is the- Why it fundamentally- Why is the information leak? Yeah. Like, I mean, it feels like you, that purity is- uh, No, no. Anytime you leak, leak information, you, tight, you more tightly couple specifications and upgrades. Right, so but like, I think I think they are that tightly coupled. Simply, like I mean, it happens to be like easy because the current slot times are very close to each other with twelve and fourteen seconds. But if we had very different slot times, we would have to make other changes. Like I, I would just say, like they, sorry, they are coupled. <laughs> uh, Lucas, you have your hand up. Yeah, I will probably throw a wrench into the works, but. Um... It feels like we are thinking about uh, fixing a consensus problem in execution engine in general. Um, so the question from me would be why the consensus uh, potentially cannot handle this like more like click does that you can produce out of order blocks if someone misses their slot or something like that. You can, um, you can, but the, I mean the the way that the way that a proposer is selected is just fundamentally different than proof of work and proof of stake, and so you could do some sort of backup model where it's slot in if somebody doesn't show up in a second, you could have somebody do a backup, but that's uh, still even if you did that, you could have missed slots um, and result in reduced capacity. Um, which it seems natural for the EVM to be aware of. Oh, and Scar? Yeah, I just wanted to briefly say uh, with regards to the, to the conversation about leaking uh, information about the block time, slot time, and into to the execution client, I don't actually think that this is avoidable just because. Uh, even if we set the gas throughput per second and the block gas limit separately, we still want them to go up and down in lockstep, right? So like, right. Um, because otherwise we don't have a mechanism. And so we would still need to hard code the elasticity. And if we hard code the elasticity of 24 between the two, then we are already hard coding again, the, the slot time just in a hidden way. So- um, why, why do we want them to go uh, up in lockstep? How would you, how else would you ever was um, yeah, move the- yeah, the, the gas limit and the gas target up and down separately. I'm sorry, I thought you were saying the gas, the, the block time, you, when, when that increases, you would want the gas limit to go up at the same time. I misunderstood. No, no, I mean, I mean, actually like with the signal, like with this, like just as um, right now, and I don't think we want to have the EIP that would remove the control by the block proposal from uh, at the point of the merge. So right now block proposals can slightly nudge the gas limit up and down, right? and um, if they continue to be able to do so, we would hope that also the uh, gas target per second would go up or down by the same uh, like fraction. Um, and so um, we could we could make it so 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 this is this is where it gets into the a bigger change to avoid the data the information leak. But one one can imagine a change where the way that they increase is now you increase the uh, gas per second rate instead of the gas per block rate. And so the, the limit that would go up is the per second rate. And so every proposer can do one 10 24th increase or decrease in the gas limit or in the gas per second rate. How would the limit go up or down? 
So just like the rates, like if we want, you know, 10 gas per second or a thousand gas per second or whatever, and that's our target, then each proposer can say, I would like to increase or decrease that by up to one ten twenty fourth, which would be functionally the same as them currently increasing the block limit by one ten twenty fourth. But but what would be the block limit in that world? Like, would the block, block limit be set separately, or would it just be automatically part of that? Or the, would yeah, you the, the, block, the, block the block limit would be the block limit would automatically be calculated. Uh, I see what you're saying. But okay. if it's automatically yeah, calculated yeah. As by twenty four times that number, there is your block. Yeah, you're, you're saying that if, yeah, if the, if the rate goes up, um, then our if the rate goes or if the slot time goes up then it means that the block limit would also go up. And that isn't necessarily what we want. Like we may want um, blocks to come every, uh, I don't know. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop talking for a minute and what I think. Right. And just to briefly pop, pop, maybe pop it out here, um, I, th I think it's probably not, not ideal to just talk about these details too much. Yeah, I, I definitely think that like this is just a specific proposal that just came out of me talking to a couple of people. So. I think there are definitely other flavors of this that would maybe even be, 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 be better to reach the same goal. The question is really more, do we think, A, this is just necessary for the merge itself, or could we just wait for Shanghai to come up with like a really solid and, and well worked out solution? And if we think we should want to do it as part of the merge, um, maybe just talk briefly about how we go from here and then do the actual discussion offline, I think. Yeah, that seems reasonable. Um, I guess, does anyone think, yeah, we should not do this at the merge? Like, is anyone strongly opposed? And there's kind of the weak objection around like the information leak that Micah just posted in the chat, but like, assuming we, yeah, I guess that aside, does anyone feel like it's not something we should do? Like I said before, I'm not convinced this this is a execution plan problem. Right. But... Right, right. So, but it could be on the consensus layer side, sure. But it's it's, and and I guess the trade off there is obviously you know, if we do it and it's non trivial, it does add some work related to the merge. Um, but it does seem important. Um, at the very least, kind of seem worth exploring more. Um. I mean, just to, to speak to that, there's always additional things you could probably do in the consensus layer to try to avoid missed slots, but there is just a stronger notion of time and there is a notion of something not happening during the time, even if you do shore it up in some ways. And so there is this notion of like, you can have missed slots and I don't think that's gonna go away. And thus the EVM can either react to that or not with respect to its capacity. Right. Um, so there are certainly concerns in the consensus layer, and you probably want to make sure that try to make sure that slots aren't missed, or there's recovery in the case of slots being missed, but the slots will always be able to be missed. Right. Um, does it make sense to maybe just schedule like a breakout room for this sometime next week or the week after, or something like that? It does feel like we probably want to think through the like design space and like come with some proposal that at least you know yeah we we all agree makes like the right trade-offs um i definitely no. suggest this coming week um i do okay. think that this if we do yeah. anything to the evm that this is uh the thing to do with the merge um i do think that 10 percent of block proposals going offline because of some reason or other is, is like totally something that could happen and having uh reducing the incentive for that to be happen from from an attacker and uh reducing the impact that it has on the execution layer and on capacity i think is very nice to have and if it's going to happen then we need to really expedite making a decision but would it really uh, decrease the incentive like if i if i have a validator and i know that the validator right before me uh, i know the ip of the validator i can just toss the validator right before me and then create a block that's double as big so there's two types of uh, i guess attack incentives one is validator to validator and the other would be external 
and it reduces the external incentive to attack and it might actually increase as you noted the uh some of the intra validator attack incentives so yeah we should think about that okay so yeah maybe as a next step angscar can you uh maybe propose a couple times that work for you and awkward devs for next week and uh we can we can have like a, a round table there yeah works for me awesome yeah thank you for for working on this and presenting it today um okay last thing on the agenda uh which i suspect will probably take up the bulk of the call is uh Denkrad and guillaume have been working on stateless and virtual trial implementations to facilitate that and they wanted to share uh just kind of the a, the general roadmap around stateless and, and why it's important and, and, and kind of the solution space they're in, and then why specifically vertical tries are an important step uh, in that direction. Um, yeah, so I'll let the two of you uh, go with it. Thank you, Guillaume. Hey, uh, I just shared my screen. Can you see that? Yes, we can. Yep. yep. Okay, so I, I wanted to give a quick um, overview um, over the virtual try work for everyone uh, on this call so that um, you know where we are and like why we are um, proposing these uh, changes and that are quite fundamental. Um, and so I'll, I'll start by quickly like just um, giving a very rough um, uh, idea on, 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 on the whole thing. So, so what's a virtual try? Virtual stands for vector commitment uh, and Merkle. And so it's basically a tree um, that works similar to Merkle trees, but the commitments um, are vector commitments instead of hashes. And uh, try stands for tree and retriever. So like, um, it just means a tree where each node represents a prefix um, of keys, uh, which is already the case in the current uh, Merkle partition trees. Um, and so what does that mean? So when we look at a um, Merkle proof, I made an illustration here. Um, if we want to prove this, um, this green leaf, then when we go up the, um, the tree, we need to compute all the yellow nodes, all the hashes at the yellow nodes, right? And for that, we need to provide all the siblings um, of either the green or yellow nodes so that we can uh, always compute um, the parent hash. Okay, if we change this um, here, I, I showed like um, it, what, what happens if we go to width uh, four instead of uh, the binary tree that I've shown just now um, for a Merkle tree, then what happens is um, we've reduced the depth, um, but now we need to give three siblings um, at each layer instead of the one we had previously. And so actually by increasing the width, we increase the size of the proofs, which is like currently uh, one of the big problems um, with Ethereum state um, that Merkle partition trees are actually with 16, so the proofs are huge. And so how do Merkle trees change this? So here is an illustration of what happens in a Merkle tree for the same situation. We again have the green uh, leaf that we want to open. Um, and um, instead of having to provide all the witnesses, um, in, a, in a good vector commitment, in quotation mark. Um, so like in uh, one of the, the ones that we are going to propose, um, instead of having to give all the siblings, which is happen happens when you use a hash as a vector commitment, which is what Merkle trees do, um, you only need one opening for each of these layers. And, uh, and that opening is constant sized. Um, so that's why suddenly it becomes efficient to increase the width because the, the proof size doesn't suddenly increase, but instead it decreases. And so um, if we have this uh, very tiny example, then, um, then we have to just provide this inner zero one node as part of the proof and these two openings um, uh, as part of the vector commitment openings. And even better, Typically, we're going to use additive commitments. So all these openings will collapse into one. Um, so that's basically like a short summary. Like here, basically what happens is you have to give this one inner node and one opening that gives a proof that leaf 0110 was part of inner 01 and inner 01 was part of, of the root. 
Um, so there you can see uh, where vocal trees get, gain their efficiency. It's from this, this property that you don't need to give all the siblings anymore, but only like a small proof that everything is a part um, of the parent. Okay, so um, I made a short illustration here like on how, how good they are. Um, so basically, like we are, we're going to suggest that um, the proposed gas cost per state axis um, will be 1,900 gas, and at the current gas limit, that would mean about 15,000 state axes. Um, if you use a hexa Merkle tree, um, then currently the witness sizes are about three kilobytes per witness, and that's 47 megabytes. So that's absolutely huge. If we change this to a binary Merkle tree, uh, we would have about half a kilobyte per witness and then we would get eight megabytes. That's still pretty big. Now, if we use a width 256 vertical tree instead with a 32 byte group, um, so like each commitment has 32 bytes as it has now, um, but it's gonna be a different type of commitments, um, then it would only be about a hundred bytes per witness. And so that reduces it to 1.5 megabytes. And now we're finally in a range that uh, we can consider is, is reasonable and lets us uh, do statelessness. Um, some summaries on the cost. So um, I made some estimates here. If, if we want to do uh, 5,000 proofs, so each, um, each of the 25,000 openings that you would have to compute um, would uh, need 256 times four field operations. Each of them costs about 30 nanoseconds. So that's 750 milli milliseconds for such a proof. So that seems pretty reasonable uh, in terms of prover time. So that's the one that a block producer would have to do. Um, and the verifier would have to do a multi-scalar multiplication. Um, the size of it is determined by the number of commitments uh, that are opened. Um, so uh, it's an MSM of size 15,000 for these 5,000 proofs and that we estimate it can be done in about 50 to 150 milliseconds. These are all estimates based on like the raw speed of these space operations. So uh, benchmarks are still coming in and um, we need more optimizations to actually get there. Okay, so um, I'm going to come to the tree structure that we're going to suggest um, because that's important uh, for the roadmap and why we are um, uh, suggesting uh, doing these changes in a certain order. And um, the design goals that we had in mind when we, when we came up with the structure is that uh, we want to make um, access to neighboring code chunks and storage slots cheap. Um, but at the same time distributes everything as evenly possible as possible in the tree. So that state sync becomes easy. Um, these two goals may, might seem contradictory, but the way we do it is that uh, we, um, we aggregate this um, neighboring code and storage slots into uh, chunks of 256 and, um, and only within these it's cheap and then these can be fairly evenly distributed. And then we want this whole thing to be um, fast in plain text, which means uh, fast in the direct applications as we're suggesting it now. Um, but we also want it to be fast in snacks. So we envision that uh, within a few years, um, it will become uh, very feasible to, um, to compress all these witnesses using snacks. And, um, and for that, um, we optimized everything um, so that it can be done very efficiently in snacks. Um, and that would also help anyone who designs rollups with this or anyone who wants to create state proofs um, and uh, feed them into a snark. And uh, finally, the whole thing should be forward com uh, compatible. So we're basically designing a pure key value interface um, with 32 bytes per key and per value. So keys um, are basically derived from the contract address and the storage location. Um, and uh, what we're going to do is like the, uh, um, the two will be uh, used to derive a stem and a suffix. And the stem 
um, is simply Pedersen. Uh, see Pedersen as a type of hash, but one that's um, also efficient to compute in a snark um, of the contract address and the storage location, except for the last byte, right? So we're excluding the last bytes in this. And then as the, we put the last byte of the storage location directly into the suffix. And so um, for any storage location that only differs in the last byte, the nice thing about this is that um, the stem will be the same and only this last byte um, will, will differ. And then we're going to put them into a tree that looks like this. We basically have this um, worker try at the start that um, locates the stem. Um, and that works very similar to like the current, uh, the current account try. Um, and then at each stem, there will be an extension node um, that commits to all the data in that extension. And so that means that um, like opening several points of data in the same extension, uh, which we, um, yeah, or the, like the same suffix tree, uh, which we also call it, um, is very cheap because like the whole stem tree is already opened at that point. There's nothing new to do. Um, and you just have to do, open another point in uh, these polynomials, C1 or C2. And so that is, that is a very fast operation and very cheap. Um, yeah, so as a, as a rough summary, basically we have a huge reduction in witness size, sizes. Um, uh, it's about uh, five times smaller compared to binary uh, Merkle trees and um, more than 30 times uh, smaller than the current hex three trees. So that's pretty huge. Um, and verification times are pretty reasonable, like similar to a binary Merkle tree. Um, uh, the prover overhead um, isn't huge. So like even in the worst case, it's um, I estimate it can be done in a few seconds. Um, our solution doesn't need any kind of trusted setup. So it's all um, basic elliptic curve arithmetic, which we're already using in Ethereum, uh, just the discrete logarithm assumption. And uh, I think it's a currently the only known solution for Ethereum state that doesn't come with like huge trade-offs in terms of how big the witnesses are and everything. Right, um, so yeah, this was my quick uh, introduction. Um, I can't see, is, are there any questions about it at the moment? I don't think there were any, well, there were a couple like technical questions in this chat, but I think mm -hmm. they all got answered. Um, okay, Yeah. great. Yeah, um, I, I mean, Danny, please feel Danny free. had one that's not answered. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, so please feel free, like if anyone has any questions about this, like reach out to me. I'm, I'm very happy to explain anything. I also wrote a few blog posts about it. Um, yeah, it's obviously like uh, some uh, something to get into and uh, it is a big change, but I think it, it also comes with huge advantages. So um, I also yeah, I gave know. a peep and, peep and eep talk if anyone wants to, I, I think it has some more details. Sorry, Daniel. I did have a question from the chat. Um... You showed the max witness, like worst case witness size. Uh, do you have data on what the witness sizes would be with you know, current average main size, main net size? Oh, so that's, not, so that's not technically the max witness size. That is, uh, the, I mean, there are different, different definitions of max. Like that is the, the max if you don't spam the tree. So what I shared here was a rough estimate. If you have like a block that does only state accesses for the whole block, um, right. but uh, that's the slide, right? But it's not about, so if you spam the tree, there are some worse things that you can do um, in all of the cases, mm -hmm. obviously. I think um, the, the the average case is like, should be a couple hundred kilobytes. Yeah, I do have actually, and I wanted to share that as well. Um, I, I actually made a little calculator, um, which I can share um, where you can play with these things. Uh, sorry. <laughs> um, so it's this one, and basically um, uh, how you can use this one, this one uses all our suggested um, parameters. Um, you can adjust um, uh, 
how many elements are in the tree. It will compute what the average depth is. This is all the input for the suggested gas changes. And then you can enter numbers on what you think. Like, so this is an example where we access 1000 different branches, so 1000 stems essentially, uh, 4000 chunks. Then we have like um, 400 update, different branches update and 1200 chunks updated. Then it gives a number here that would be the gas cost for this. So this, this, this example would uh, spend more than 6 million in gas dust on a state axis. So that seems maybe like a roughly reasonable average case. I don't know, maybe even high average case. I don't know if people are gonna spend that much. I don't know, hard to estimate right now because people are obviously also going to adapt. So in this case, the total data. So this is any, any scheme has to provide the data, right? So that, that's an absolute must. Um, unless you snark the whole execution, you have to provide the data. Um, the data size here would be about 200 kilobytes. Um, the total proof size, so that's all the commitments and the opening that you have to give in addition would be 110 kilobytes. So the total witness size would be um, 308 kilobytes. So that this is like a roughly average case. Um, and I put this on the on the ACD uh, call as a link as well. So please like feel free to make a copy of this sheet and play with it. And yeah, here are numbers on like the, what the prover time would be like 250 milliseconds and the total verification time. Um, 64 milliseconds, obviously all of these are estimates at the moment. Cool, those, so basically, those, yeah, mm -hmm. sorry. Those benchmark, those benchmark estimates, are they on um, just like what kind of very rough class of hardware is that estimating? That, on that's, like a, that's, a, that's a recent like Intel CPU basically. Like, like a laptop or like a server? Um, it's not parallelized, so it shouldn't really make any difference. Like it's single thread. Okay. Yeah. So it's one, one thread on a modern Intel CPU-ish. Yeah, that's my estimate. Like, as I said, so these are basically okay. based on what's the dominant operation for each of these things and like estimating how many of these, of, uh, of these you need. I think these two things are like fairly, um, uh, I can estimate fairly well. Um, however, this does depend on eliminating all the other bottlenecks. So just to be clear here, the prover time, this would only be the time to actually generate the proof. Um, I would say like, it's very likely that most of your time will actually be spent like getting the stuff from the database. Like that's, you still need to do that, that's separate. Cool. And um, so uh, the reason uh, why we brought this to the um, call now is that um, what we want to suggest is that um, we, uh, we basically ha have created um, an idea for a roadmap how we, um, how we make Ethereum stateless. Um, and um, the idea is this, um, the idea is to spread the changes um, over three different hard forks. And, um, uh, and at the end of it, um, well, actually like Ethereum would uh, not be stateless in itself, but, but it would, uh, would gain optional statelessness. And I will explain in a minute what that means. And uh, the changes um, would be um, for the first hard fork, which I suggest to be uh, Shanghai would be to make the gas cost changes um, uh, in order to like um, enab enable all this. And the reason for making the gas cost changes first is, well, one is they are relatively um, a bit easier to implement than the whole database structure or the, the, well, actually we need to make some changes for to the database structure, but the whole commitment structure. Um, uh, and two, the most important thing is I think to give signals um, to like developers as early as possible um, on like how they, how they should handle state access in the future. Basically each month where like state access remains cheap and everything remains as it is, is another, is another month where like new contracts will get deployed and uh, they will all depend on the current gas schemes and they will all be upset when later everything changes and some stuff becomes super expensive or they could have developed in a more efficient way. So that's really annoying. So it would be um, just so much better if like as early as possible, we could get them to the right numbers. And I think realistically, let's be honest, the only way to do that 
is to actually change the gas costs. Um, and so that is why uh, I, I suggest in the first hard fork to make these gas cost changes. Um, in the subsequent um, hard fork, um, I call it like Shanghai plus one here, Cancun or whatever that is. Um, what we do is we just freeze the current Merkel partition tree root as it, as it is exactly at that point. And we add a worker try commitment. Um, and that is initially going to be an empty commitment and we'll just track all the changes from then on. And at Shanghai plus two, we replace the frozen Merkel partition tree root um, with um, a worker try root. And um, uh, the reason for that is that um, with this roadmap, there at no point uh, does there need to be an online recomputation of the state. Like all the recomputations on database and commitments can be done in the background and that don't have to be done online. Okay, and uh, so the gas cost changes, um, I, so uh, Guillaume and well, I mean, it's based on work by Vitalik um, that Guillaume has separated them here into a separate um, EIP draft. Um, and uh, the idea is basically uh, this. So I, I design, I like keep in mind this design for the vocal tree. So we have this, these different parts. We have the stem tree um, where you basically uh, try to group things together that, that are in similar storage locations. And then the extension nodes, which um, is like a, a node rep representing like 256 storage locations that are close together. And so basically we have typically two different kinds of costs. We have like a cost if you access any of these stem trees and a separate cost when you access um, chunks that are within a stem tree that you've already accessed. And so the, uh, sorry, within the suffix that, sorry, within a stem that you've already accessed in the same suffix tree. So, okay. Um, and so the nice thing about that is that um, some things will actually get cheaper. Um, so, and I mean, that that's, I guess, like one good news for smart contract developers, not everything will, every state access will suddenly become crazy expensive. If they design things well, then, um, then they can actually save some gas. And so we have here suggested um, basically these five different um, costs that depend on what you do. So basically, if you access any stem for each stem that you access during transaction, you pay 1,900 gas. Um, if for each chunk that you access, you pay 200. So if you access, say, uh, 10 chunks within the same stem, then you would uh, get a cost of 2,000 gas from that plus 1,900 for the stem, so a total of um, 3,900. Um, and uh, then in addition, like writing, so for each stem that you write to, you pay a fixed cost of 3,000. Again, for each chunk within that stem, you pay 500. So if you added 10 of these, then you pay like 5,000, but you only pay this one once if, it, if they're all within the same stem. And finally, when you, um, when you fill a new uh, chunk, so when you, when you add another um, node here that has never been written to before, then you pay 6,200. So like adding new state is still somewhat expensive. Uh, and finally, this may, might be um, one of the most controversial of all the changes, but I think it's overall just important and um, we should do it and figure out a way to do it. Um, basically deactivating the self-destruct. Um, so the way we deactivate is we name, rename it to send all and um, it moves all ETH um, in the account to the target, but it doesn't do anything else. Um, so it doesn't destroy code, it doesn't destroy any storage um, and it doesn't refund um, anything for just for yeah, destroying those because they aren't destroyed. Um, yeah, uh, so that's that's basically that would be the suggested changes um, for the Shanghai um, hard fork. Um, so I mean, it's mainly uh, gas cost changes. However, um, unfortunately, they do require 
um, and that's one of the things why I'm trying to introduce this whole thing early and get feedback on it, um, it will require changes to the database because um, we are basically reducing the costs uh, for these chunk um, accesses. And that means if in practice they have, they have the same costs still like as they have now, um, then that's uh, a DOS vector um, and that would be annoying. So it would require that clients already make some of the adaptations to their database so that um, accessing uh, the, the chunks within the same stem tree, within the same stem uh, would be cheap. And um, I think the reasonable way to do that is if um, people would just store this whole thing, this whole extension um, in one location in the database. So that's the easy way. Like it's um, even if, if the suffix tree is full, that's about eight kilobytes of data. Um, and so that's not a huge amount. And um, basically every time you read that, you just read the whole thing from disk. And, um, and then basically, because like whether you read 32 bytes or like 10 kilobytes from disk like makes almost no difference. It's always the number of IO operations that um, actually matters um, that, uh, that should alleviate uh, that um, concern. Yeah, so that would be the uh, suggestion for the um, uh, Shanghai hard fork. Um, the next hard fork, um, we would freeze the Merkle partition root and add um, a Merkle try commitment. Um, so we would say like the current state root um, is frozen exactly as it is and no changes are made to it. And then we add this empty Merkle try root that contains nothing. But whenever anything from the state is uh, written to or even read from, we just transfer it into the Merkle try root. Um, but that doesn't mean we remove it from the worker partition tree. We, we leave that as it is. And then in the background at any point um, between this and Shanghai uh, plus two, um, you can make uh, this background computation where you, where you recompute this MPT root as a worker root. And we would then replace the MPT root with a worker try root. And um, uh, so, that, uh, yes, so basically you can do that either, you can do that locally, but it can be done in the background because all the data is, const is constant. So even if you have to access the same database, um, like you can do that in some, in another process or anything, people can run that at any point. And um, so that's nice. You have several months to do this. Um, it could also be even a simpler solution for some, some clients to simply say like, uh, provide the converted database as a torrent, I guess there should be still a way to like verify it, but maybe not everyone has to absolutely do that. Um, it's, I mean, the trust model, if you just don't know that as a torrent is not really different from doing a snap sync. So like, as long as we have a reasonable number of people doing this, I, I don't see like that there's a security concern there. And if we actually do already have states um, expiry ready at that point, then um, we don't actually need to do a database conversion for most clients because we can simply use state expire for the last step. We can simply say uh, from now on, this first um, uh, database is expired and then you only need to literally replace the root and um, you normal clients, normal nodes that don't keep all this old state uh, don't even um, need to convert it anymore. They can just forget about it. And what's the result of this? Um, basically, we get optional statelessness. So um, at this point, uh, anyone can add block witnesses to a block. And um, um, we have uh, made sure that they are reasonably small and quick to verify and everything, and also reasonably easy to produce. And so uh, what it means is, um, we can create separate networks where we have stateless blocks. For example, one obvious one would be to simply use the, what is now the consensus network, the libp 2 p network on which all these two clients run and simply distribute uh, stateless blocks on it. Um, but there could also be more experimental other networks that, um, that do things with these stateless blocks. 
And, uh, and then um, I guess like as an optional future thing or very likely future thing is like, um, we can, for example, one way how we come to full statelessness um, is we just deprecate the old dev P2P networks, say like consensus now 100% just on lib P2P and dev P2P remains as a state sync network. So anyone who wants to have full state goes on there and that's like a network that's mainly used um, in order to get full state and um, lib P2P is used by all the consensus nodes, like clients and so on, whoever um, want, wants to get um, blocks with witnesses. Yeah, cool. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, my, that's my introduction of the whole thing. Uh, maybe, and do we have any questions at the moment? Micah has had his head up for a while. Yeah. Uh, so first question, so the, the change in Shanghai, it feels, feels like, maybe I'm missing something here, but it feels like that's a pretty significant change, like changing the database structure in a way that, so that current execution clients can correctly calculate the future gas costs. I, I'm concerned that that may be something that's they can't even do. So, um, so without, the, like, the, having the right. Um, so to be precise, you don't need, so you, you can easily compute the gas costs. So that, that's, that's not the difficult part. Like all these costs can, can be, uh, we can add that to a client right now to compute these correctly. Um, the, so so without, the without database changes, you mean, right? Yeah, yeah, without database okay. changes. So you can compute all that. Um, you, you need to compute the new keys and you need to have like some, some array where you, where you store like everything that has been accessed, but that's, that's all tiny, that's not, that's not a problem. So the problem is that we are making some things cheaper with these gas changes and that um, realistically requires some database changes in order to, yeah, I mean, I, I agree it is a concern. Um, but I, yeah, that, that's also like one of the things I want to bring here for feedback. Um, we could do it, Marius, I think is suggesting, which is um, to calculate the new gas cost and use the higher of the two. So calculate what the gas cost is using the old database layout, and then also calculate mm -hmm. what the gas cost will be, and then just use right. max of those two for each operation. Right. Um, yes. Um, the downside of that so, is, of course, we're giving nothing. We're giving nothing to smart contracts developers, right? You're making everything yes. strictly more strictly expensive. worst. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, so, I'm okay with that. Uh, I'm sure some people are. <laughs> um, so, the second question on the Shanghai plus one fork. Uh, if I understand correctly, every database lookup will require two reads: one to read the vertical tree to see if it's present, and then a second one to check the the old MPT tree, and then yeah. potentially then migrate it as well. Are we accounting for that in the gas cost, the cost of the double read and migration, or are we just going to say that hopefully this is uncommon enough that mm. there's not an attack right. vector um, by like triggering just, a huge number of migrations? As a precision, you don't actually need to go through the tree, right? You're just, uh, you're just going to keep, uh, because the tree is frozen, you can just store the the data that was in the MPT as a key value store. So it's still costing something, but it's not as expensive as going through a tree. Right. So, I mean, I guess the point is also um, maybe to be clear here, uh, I don't think there should be two databases, right? So at least the data only has to be in one database, like the, the actual keys and values. Um, like there, there should be maybe currently that's not the way it's implemented, but the right way to think about it is I think that uh, date, data and commitment scheme are two independent things. And so basically there, there are two different commitment schemes at that point, but they aren't necessarily two different databases. That makes sense. I see. So the actual key values you're imagining are in a, in a third air quotes database. And then these I other guess. two databases are just like, um, and that third database tree shape. basically, yes. And that database simply has like a little marker that okay. says, is this already in the vocal um, part or is this still in MPT? Gotcha. Out of curiosity for the client devs, does that align with your guys' current database layout? I'm particularly interested in Aragon since I know their database is very different. 
Uh, well, in, in Aragon, we have um, so-called plain state, which uh, is uh, separate uh, from the hashed uh, state required for the Milko Patricia try. So we already have that in Aragon. And uh, for us, it will be relatively easy to implement this additional Velcro try commitment. That also true for the other four clients, three right now? Um, for Basie, that's kind of hard to say. Um, I'm not sure about, <clears throat> you know, the, um, the treeing, but we do have the ability to kind of swap things out as far as the underlying data structure itself. So that's a real tough question for me to answer right now, but we'll keep an eye on it. It is one of the things we're tending to modularize the same way Aragon does. Uh, so, so related to that, that question, will we need to um, have gas accounting for the migration step? Since I'm guessing that's a non-free operation. Like if something is the first time, the first time you read something from the MPT tree and you need to write it to the vertical tree, do we need to have that cost more gas than any subsequent reads? Uh, because there is, you know, database work, disk work. And I just worry that someone could, you know, manufacture a, a block that just does a huge number of migrations in one block and potentially blow things up. Right, that's an interesting question. Um, maybe I misunderstood, but um, since the migration is happening offline, uh, first you can do you can get someone to do it for everybody else and share it. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not quite sure why. Um, no, I, I don't think I don't think the question is actually about. Um, about like the the third step where you say like yeah, yeah it's, it's for I, I think it's plus in one. exactly so basically like now we are in the state where you can access things that are in the Merkle Patricia tree you can right. access them um you can access them cheaply because they are already like like for example you can write to it without incurring the 6200 gas I guess um yeah, it's a good question. Yep. Um, and I haven't thought about I thought it through. I don't know if Vitalik has because he created this the gas, the ideas from gas costs. Um, one way to potentially think about it is to apply um, the costs from the perspective of the vertical tree. So if we say this gas, mm, yeah. I mean, I think just naively, it seems saying, like we can saying like if you access something that isn't in the vertical tree yet, then it's a write, basically. Yeah, basically, you, you charge write costs or maybe write plus read costs, whatever it is. Yeah, that could be one way of doing it. Yeah. Vitalik, have you thought about it? Don't know. She's still here. I think he left. Um, and I saw Andrew, you had a comment about uh, the target costs. Uh, do you want to kind of bring that up? Um, yeah, just uh, I think uh, um, because the new target costs are already on average higher than the status quo. So then if uh, we defensively make them even higher in the transition, that might uh, potentially be too prohibitive, too expensive for smart contracts. So. I'm thinking maybe if uh, like uh, moving, if having the new target costs requires some kind of database refactoring, perhaps it's still worth uh, doing that and delay the, the gas cost, not, not to Shanghai, but to a later fork. But probably to my mind, there's, there's some kind of database layout refactoring is a pretty much a prerequisite. Uh, that, that's my impression. Mm. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Um, we're about at time. Um, what's the best place to continue this conversation, Dankrad? Um, there's, I think we have a channel for this on the R&D Discord, do we? Yeah, we have a state expiry channel. Um, 
Right. I think that's a separate. So basically, maybe right. something. Oh, we have vertical tri migrations. Yeah. Yeah. If you look at so basically, I intentionally we intentionally designed everything so this is that it's independent from state expiry and address extension, so that all of these can be worked on independently and they aren't blockers for each other. Um, yeah. Uh, so I think next steps, yes. Uh, so I mean, I'm very happy. Like, if anyone wants to understand more, and uh, um, if they want to ask any question, like, please reach out. Um, and also, um, I guess maybe the big, uh, yeah, the big questions here, like, if uh, would be discussing about uh, these database changes that would be required for, um, for for the Shanghai um, gas cost changes that we're suggesting. Um, if we can discuss that, um, see where each client is on that and how uh, how big those are. Yeah, that would be great to understand. Okay, great. Yeah, I think we can use just the vertical tries channel here. So um, I'll, yeah, I'll just type the name in the chat here in case people are not on it. Um, yeah. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Dankrad and, and Guillaume for, for sharing and obviously working on all this. Uh, any kind of final questions? Um, okay. If anyone has any oh. ideas on how we can do address date extension, uh, that would allow us to um, prioritize uh, state expiry. And I think this pro transition process is actually significantly easier if state expiry can be done simultaneously or first. Great. Um, and there is also an address space extension channel on the Discord. Uh, one thing I'll note before we head off, uh, at least in North America, daylight savings time is changing before the next call. I'm not sure about Europe. I think so as well. Uh, but please double check the time. Uh, so the call stays at 14 UTC two weeks from now. But uh, at least in North America, that's one hour earlier in your local time. And I think that might also be true in Europe. Um, yeah, so please just double check that uh, before we meet again in two weeks. Yeah, thanks everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye. bye.